Gabby was pretty, blonde, and buxom with a cinched waist, and she possessed a sparkling stage personality. Born in November 1881 to Hippolyte and Anna Kerr, the future Mademoiselle de Lys was christened Mary Elsie Gabrielle Kerr in the then lovely French city of Marseille. Gabrielle's mother wanted to go on the stage, but married at 17 and soon had a family to raise. She gave birth to one son, one son and four daughters. The oldest daughter died in infancy. Hippolyte was 33 when he married Anna and was fully prepared to support a wife and family. He came from a family of successful textile merchants and worked with one of his brothers, Leon. The death of his first daughter and a few years later in 1885 of his only son devastated him. He grew solemn and melancholy. Although he loved his three young girls and wife, he behaved sternly towards them. Anna encouraged her daughter to develop her singing and dancing, but her father was horrified when he learned of Gabby's ambition to become an actress. He sent her to the strict religious school called the College of the Dame de Saint-Marc. In 1899, Gabby's older sister Amy died of tuberculosis, the same disease that had claimed her only brother's life. Gabby and her sister, Madachon, were terrified. There was no known cure for tuberculosis, and it was thought to be genetic. For the rest of her life, she feared sharing the same fate as her older brother and sister. After leaving the convent school, Gabby set about becoming an actress and fulfilling her own mother's dream. She picked the stage name Gabby Delise, derived from Gabby of the Lilies, a pet name given to her by her mother. In the fall of 1902, the 19-year-old Gabby boarded a train for Paris. She made her debut in October 1902 as a chorus girl. The Parisian stage brought together various elements of French society, but class distinctions were maintained. Women of the theater were often assumed to be sexually available as mistresses to wealthy and well-positioned men of society and business. Certain sections of various theaters served as meeting places between the actresses and clients, a situation that reinforced among many a negative opinion of women of the stage. Gabby practiced her dancing and carefully observed the stage techniques of the more seasoned artists around her. She was given a new song, Je Chante la Glorie de la Parisienne, that she turned into a personal success at the Mathurin's Theater. After that, her social circle and career quickly blossomed. She realized the way to promote herself to fame in the entertainment world had little to do with actual talent. She worked on her theatrical and musical skills, but she understood that it was her lovely features, her curvy form so in vogue at the time, and her witty, flirtatious manner that won her champions among the press and in her audiences. A 1904 show, A Florida Pal, kept her name and face in front of a growing audience, and she became quite well known around the town. She was never opposed to advertising and would appear on cigarette boxes and later in her career on glove advertisements. In 1905, Gabby's mother, Anna, separated from her husband and moved with her sister, Madachon, to Paris. They watched with amazement and pride as Gabby rose to celebrity status. The show that made Gabby Delise a star was Our Music Hall at the Olympia Theater, in which she introduced several acts and starred in several musical numbers. Shortly after the opening of the show, her picture was published on the cover of the widely circulated Paris Quichant magazine. Her performance captured the attention of two distinguished Englishmen, George Grossmith Jr. and his friend George Edwardes, the impresario who owned the famous Gaiety Theater in London. You will notice that while the French theaters are still standing, the Gaiety Theater was torn down in the 1950s. Gabby left Paris in August of 1906 to fulfill a three-month contract with the Gaiety Theater to plays in production, including the new Aladdin. Originally engaged to play a French maid, she found that her role was given to Jenny Alwyn, a Scottish girl. Alwyn shared the favorable notices with Gabby, who was presented more as a variety turn. She sang and danced, garbed in beautiful, revealing costumes. She was a favorite with the audience. They cheered her with her broken English, and some men even threw gifts at her or attempted to climb on stage. 
She returned to Paris with another contract to play British music halls in the winter of 1907. Gabby was neither a distinguished singer nor natural born dancer, but she could memorize a song after hearing it only a few times and was able to learn choreography quickly. She was a die hard perfectionist. Even if she was only on stage for a few minutes, she made sure to appear alluring and paid careful attention to the details of her performances. It was well known that she would upstage her co-stars, male or female. She rehearsed until she was satisfied with every component of her work. Will Bishop, a performer with the Empire Ballet and the Gaiety Theater, arranged many of her dance numbers in the early shows and coached her performances. She was a practitioner of several types of dance, such as the jiu-jitsu waltz, ballroom, grizzly bear, turkey trot, and her most famous, the Gabby Glide. Beauty, a theatrical sense, and hard work paid off in engagements at Les Ambassador and several consecutive seasons at the large and venerable Alhambra Theater, where she starred in La Cloche de Cornville, in which she did her first quasi-striptease number. Gabby Delise topped a variety playbill for the first time when she performed at the Moulin Rouge. In 1910, she appeared at the Capuchins in saint Rucune, and it was this show that attracted young King Manuel of Portugal. He was only 21 years old at the time. He and Gabby met after the show, and the two had many more informal meetings following that night. Rumors of an affair spread through the city, especially when Gabby made an appearance in Lisbon at the request of the king. Well before Gabby caught Manuel's eye, the more radical insurrectionists had assassinated the king, Manuel's father, and his older brother, the heir to the throne. Gabby was never blind to the advantages of capitalizing on publicity, regardless of its questionable veracity. Shortly thereafter, Manuel's mother, Amelie of Orléans, attempted to arrange a marriage for her son with a princess from an allied country. The once subdued gossip linking Gabby to royalty exploded into a full-fledged scandal. It was said that Gabby had been installed in the royal palace in Lisbon and showered with gifts, including an eight-foot-long rope of pearls. It was thought that after their first meeting, the king sent Gabby a pearl necklace worth 70 grand. Their relationship was anything but discreet. She would arrive before night at the palace in Lisbon and would pass through Portugal unnoticed. Abroad, meanwhile, they were on the front pages of newspapers in Europe and, Ameri and North America, especially after the king was deposed in 1910. When Gabby was first beginning to acquire wealth, she let it be known that she preferred the soft sheen of pearls to diamonds or other jewels. Many of her early show costumes featured ropes of pearls, and they became her trademark. None of the scandalous rumors in Portugal had a negative impact on Gabby's immense popularity in Britain and France, but in October, a violent revolution in Portugal forced King Manuel to flee and sail for Gibraltar on a yacht crewed by fishermen. He was criticized in the press for giving Gabby costly presents, including emeralds from King Francis I, at the expense of a nearly bankrupt country. Even in America, newspapers blamed Gabby for costing the king his throne, even though it was not her fault, and anarchists had been active since before Gabby was on the scene. Regardless, Manuel married Augusta Victoria of Hohenzollern in 1913, which depressed Gabby. She had maintained contact with some of the king's staff, but she learned that she had to move on. Gabby struck while gossip was hot. She demanded more money from her employers in the wake of her affair with King Manuel, threatening to break contracts and get more lucrative jobs if she was not paid what she felt she deserved. She left France and arrived in New York in September 1911, under contract to the Schubert brothers who owned a monopoly of hundreds of theaters in North America. Thanks to their publicity mill, the American public was aware of Gabby Delise before she even stepped on an American stage. The Schuberts tried out Gabby in their Review of Reviews, a flop that ran for 55 performances at the Winter Garden in the fall of 1911. She had a great deal of trouble with her English in her one dance sketch, Le Debut de Chichin, a segment of the Review of Reviews, but attracted some attention for her naughty sexy image of the demi-monde, 
women of France considered to be on the edge of respectable society. As soon as that show closed, the Schubert's put Gabby in Vera Violetta, a three-part entertainment. Al Jolson headed the cast along with Stella Mayhew, and he made it his show. Gabby faced a lot of competition as the show boasted three of the sexiest women in show business at the time, Annette Kellerman, the champion swimmer, famous for her daring one-piece bathing suits, Mae West, who would become a sex symbol, and Jose Collins, who revived her mother's famous number, ta ra ra boom Dier. Fortunately, Gabby was partnered with dancer Harry Pilcher, who was born in 1885 and studied alongside Fred Astaire in dance schools in Paris. As well as being a compatible dance partner, he wrote the lyrics for what became Gabby's theme song, The Gabby Glide, which you can listen to on YouTube today. The dance was performed with both Gabby and Harry facing forward, she in front of him. Her left arm was hooked behind his neck, and he guided her by clasping her right hand behind her back. Their two bodies were pressed together, her body arched forward after, and her head tilted back onto his shoulder. Harry was an accomplished dancer, but rumors swirled about him. It was whispered that he was a homosexual, a male prostitute, and a gigolo, all of which, if true, qualified him to be one of the more versatile men of the American stage. Gabby was captivated by his style, and the two made a sexy dance team. Harry started devising the choreography for their routines, and several of their numbers were set in boudoirs with boudoir costumes, which gave them added zest. Gabby's and Harry's public association on and off the stage led to rumors of romance. Early in 1912, Gabby, at the peak of her popularity, ended her first visit to America where she was not very popular with Midwestern audiences, and returned to Europe with Harry. France welcomed her home with great enthusiasm, and the pair had their choice of engagements until they returned to the USA in November 1912 to continue working with the Schuberts. She and Harry toured with Al Jolson in a Schubert review, The Social Whirl, and then opened on Broadway in another Schubert review, The Honeymoon Express of 1913. The Belle of Bond Street in 1914 with Lottie Collins and Sam Bernard flopped at the Schubert Theater. Gabby's stage costumes were expressive imitations of the latest styles, including extensive headdresses and jewelry, tailored to be original and shocking. She appeared on stage in short skirts, tight tops, dragging trains, accompanied by her trademark strands of pearls and giant feathery hats or headpieces. Each new outfit had to top the one before to keep men excited and women talking. Gabby was more successful in the big cities of the East Coast than on tour. Still, she landed a film contract with Adolf Zukor, founder of Famous Players, a photo play company that in 1912 had distributed Queen Elizabeth, which starred Gabby's fellow star, Sarah Bernhardt. Gabby's movie, Her Triumph, was filmed in Paris. She sailed for Europe in May 1914 with Harry. In the fall of 1914, Gabby starred in The Raja's Ruby at the Palace in Paris. The show was a hit despite the outbreak of the Great War, World War I. In 1915, Gabby purchased a home in London across the corner from the Royal Albert Hall and appeared in the less successful productions of Rosie Rapture and The New World. Rosie Rapture seems to have been taken over by the aesthetic movement at the time, judging by this Aubrey Birdsley designed program. You can learn more about Birdsley and the aesthetics on my channel. Rosie Rapture also counted George Bernard Shaw amongst its cast. I believe it is around this period that Gabby met the playwright J.M. Barry and his ward, Nico Llewellyn Davies, who remembered seeing Rosie Rapture 10 or 12 times and falling out of the box every time in delight at the music. Nico, decades later, also remembered sitting on Gabby's knee. Nico would have been only 12 years old at the time, but it shows the kind of company Gabby was keeping with famous playwrights, and you can learn more about J.M. Barry on my channel. Nico was asked about her outfits, and he replied he only ever saw her in stage wear, prompting the question if she wore such clothing all the time. 
She used her fame to support the French war effort by collecting money, presumably for the Red Cross, which J.M. Barry helped establish, entertaining wounded soldiers, and promising kisses to new recruits. Gabby sought a romantic relationship that would provide emotional security, which her dance partner, Harry, was unable or unwilling to offer, maybe due to his homosexuality. Professionally, he wanted to be more than a supporting player in their act. When she realized she was not going to have a romantic relationship with Harry, she turned her attention to department king Gordon Selfridge, a well-known London businessman who was long married to his wife at the time. Harry soon found himself another dancing partner, but neither Harry nor Gabby equaled the success they found as stage partners together. Gabby struggled with throat and voice problems during late 1914. She was operated on multiple times in an effort to eradicate the infection due to Spanish influenza on two occasions without the use of an anesthetic. Surgeons were inhibited by Gabby's demand that they must not scar her neck. She was admitted to the hospital for surgery and recu recuperated at her home in the south of France. In the summer of 1915, she appeared again at the Alhambra in 5064 Gerard. Harry Pilcher was also written into the script at Gabby's insistence. Gabby and Harry were back in the USA late in 1915 for Stop, Look, Listen. She and Harry did another variation of their dance act, but the storyline was carried by other stars. Gabby's and Harry's differences were making it difficult to do their best on stage. It only made matters worse that her mother, who disliked or distrusted Harry, had predicted such an outcome for their relationship a long time beforehand. In May of 1916, Gabby sailed from New York for London without Harry. Her health had begun to decline, and she worried about coping with the rheumatism that was plaguing her mother and sister. She was determined to make as much money as possible to cushion her life in her later years, and we see her being featured as dolls and in advertisements. Despite declining numbers in theater attendance, she remained in the spotlight per by performing in numerous shows through the war years, including fashion and cultivating her fans. She and Harry made up their differences and appeared at the Femina Theater. During the show's run, Gabby met the famous Russian costume designer Romain de Tertov, better known as Erte, and he created some very memorable costumes for her. I love Erte, and so the fashion here is quite remarkable. On a number of occasions, Gabby appeared at the Grand Casino in Marseille. Her final performance there was in 1919. Her passion for Marseille and its people was matched by her animosity towards her critics among French editors. One of her most prominent detractors was Ernest Charles. She sued him for 50,000 francs in August 1912. She at first considered hiring a groom to horsewhip Charles in public before her lawyer advised against it. By 1919, Gabby was complaining of illness again, and Harry resumed his solo career as she sought various treatments. Physicians discovered a tumor in Gabby's throat. Despite several painful surgeries, her condition rapidly worsened. She died in February 1920, just 38 years old. Her good friend, Harry Pilcher, had not been informed of her condition in time to visit her deathbed, and he was distressed about being excluded. He took time to mourn her death and then established a dancing school in France. Gabby's mother and Harry were both devastated, but animosity kept them apart. When Gabby's will was made public, it was reported she had left small amounts of money to people she had work who had worked for her, and a generous sum for Harry Pilcher. Her jewelry and many other belongings were sold at auction. Her estate, rumored to reach into the millions of dollars, was left to her mother and sister, who were to spend only a fourth of it. The remainder was slated to be used for the poor. Gabby's dream was that her villa would be made into a children's hospital dedicated to the memory of her brother and sisters who had died from tuberculosis. She wanted the hospital in her former home, Villa Gabby, to bear her name. In her will, Delise left her villa on the Marseille Corniche Road and all of her property in Marseille to the poor of Marseille. The property at the time was valued at 500 grand, which is well into the millions today. According to the Pittsburgh Press, on July 18, 1920, describing her living quarters, 
It was as follows. In an adjoining room was the exquisite bed that belonged to the celebrated Duchess de Fontage, one of several beds of equal historical value, which Gabby used in rotation. In cabinets about her were Limoges enamels that had been the joy of great King Francis I. On the walls were paintings by Botticelli and other Italian masters. On the bookshelves were priceless volumes printed by Elzevir and Aldous Minutius. Her carved and gilded bed was inspired by the boat in the Grotto of Venus scene from the opera Tannhäuser. On its bow, there are two cherubs with images from Boucher's Cupid's Target. The bed was bought at auction in Marseille by Metro Pictures. It was used in the 1922 film Trifling Women starring Barbara Lamar, who you can learn more about on my channel. Later, it came into the possession of the Universal Studios prop department and it was used in the 1925 film The Phantom of the Opera. In 1934, it was used in the film 20th Century and in 1950, we see it in Sunset Boulevard as the bed of Norma Desmond played by Gloria Swanson. In 1943, Gabby's life story was bought by MGM as a potential film property for Judy Garland, but it was shelved after a few script treatments. As executor of the will, Gabby's mother decided against building the mausoleum that Gabby had wanted because she thought it was too expensive. The people of Marseille erected a statue to Gabby in the cemetery anyway. Gabby's mother also refused proposals to begin work on Gabby's hospital. When Gabby's mother died in 1936, the Villa Gabby was converted into the School of Hydrology and later into a refuge for troops during World War II. At the end of the 20th century, the building was still being used as a hostel for international students doing medical research. Sadly, Gabby's dream of a children's hospital was never realized. The University of Arizona possesses a number of sheet music featuring Gabby and Harry, as well as an original program for the Honeymoon Express from the Winter Garden production in New York City. And citing that is part of the first American tour of Mademoiselle Gabby Delise, accompanied by the 50 Gabby Delise girls. There are many photos of all the costumes and elaborate hats worn by Gabby, the string of pearls that was her trademark and the critical reviews included reflected on Gabby's popular appeal at the time. Gabby Delise sang in delightful broken English, danced her little hat off, and was applauded long and loud. Gabby sings and dances several times and wears wonderful little, very little costumes. She also wears great ropes of pearls. Now listen to Gabby Delise singing two songs in Vienna in 1910.